your screen, hit play, so check this. this is the hard knock life, but not the chick of kind More like the people in the world seeking perspectives with a different life The kids who share their interests together uh, the Welcome back one more time to a live edition of Hard Knock Life here at Cross Lines at the Smithsonian. I'm joined by the wonderful artist Matt Wynn, who is also part of the Nerds of Color Lounge this weekend, uh, doing a fantastic live mural uh, that we'll talk about in a minute. So, uh, Matt, welcome to uh, Hard Knock Life in Smithsonian. Thanks, uh, what Can you talk, tell a little bit about uh, how you got involved with this project and then um, what you're doing here this weekend? Yes, yeah, so uh, one of the curators, Lawrence, he knew my work um, particularly my interactive comic, The Boat, and we talked about working together. And when this came up, it would be a good fit for me to show off. Well, I was going to say, is this something that you do normally, this like live mural painting? Yeah, I don't. I used to do it, do it a lot. I used to have an artist collective back in Sydney where we would do large scale public artwork, um, big murals and things like that, but I haven't done it in a hot minute. But it's it's like really free to work that weekend. Yeah. Also, the door kind of content as well. Kind of rare. So how so how has it been this weekend doing this doing this mural? Like just since you since you hadn't done it in a while, what's the experience been like? Has it been tiring? Has it has it been exhilarating? It's been tiring, but I think more because of the duration. Yeah. The actual work seems like pretty easy. Mm. Maybe that's because I don't do it that often. So my benchmark <laughs> is like pretty low. It's like get it done. <laughs> like let's execute this. But yeah, it's been great. Like, it's mostly been talking to people about yeah. it and what we're doing. Here. Can you talk a little bit about what the image is in particular? Like, what 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 are you drawing and what are you hoping to uh, kind of communicate through the image? Yeah, so the, the mural is basically a backdrop to this comic book now. So I'm just trying to set the mood here for this book slot that's going to happen. And um, I just wanted to take advantage of drawing really fun pop genres. So there's a superhero. Um, transformation, a kind of Wonder Woman 12, Cinderella thing going on, and um, a vampiric Nosferatu esque transformation as well, like a horror genre thing. And I just wanted to use those genres and transformations and the idea of alter egos and secret identities to mm -hmm. talk about intersectionality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, what people who may not be familiar with the type of work you do, like you talked about the boat, which is an interactive comic. What do you mean by interactive comic? So the boat, so it's all online and it's all free, this comic, and it merges animation with sound design and archival footage and film and text and everything else. So there's, there's a lot going on. So it, it was like kind of taking this very solitary, very intimate medium and working with all these other collaborators on it, so that, that was quite a challenge. And then where can people find the boat? So the web address is sbs.com.au slash the boat. It's pretty long. Yeah, if you just Google my name in the boat, you'll get it. <laughs> yeah, so, so SBS is, is a, it's an Australian television uh, studio network, and they produced it. So it's pretty lucky to do a comic, let alone a web comic, with all the funding of a TV station. So it's a pretty rare, rare opportunity. And we spent like a year on it. And then how does it kind of relate to the other work that you typically do? Because you do comics, but you don't... A lot of people, when they hear the word comics, they think superheroes, men in tights kind of thing. Like, how do you describe the type of comic work that you typically do? Because even though this is very genre, you don't do a lot of superhero work. Yeah, I, I don't do a lot of genre stuff. A, a lot of my work is about... Um, exploring my identity and my, and my background. And a lot of it's a, a reason to look at parts of my personal history that for whatever reason I've averted my eyes from. So it might be the way I've grown up or my parents' lives. And the boat in particular is about um, my parents' refugee journey after the fall of Saigon, and how they escaped on boats and from pirates and all that kind of stuff. So a, a lot of it's our personal identity. A lot of my work is non-fiction or thinly veiled autobiography and transforming that into someone. Uh, so we were talking about your, you know, your, the particular work that you do is not necessarily uh, genre focused in the way that most people think of comics, but you do have a lot of opinions about uh, superhero comics and the like. You, you, you enjoy that medium. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Like, I'm not doing it to avoid it or anything. I don't know, I guess it rubs, you know, like, I, I'm, I'm Australian and my ethnic background is Vietnamese, 
And so if it, if it means spending a year making a comic um, based in a superhero genre or doing something about my life or something, I don't know. Like, I just feel like I have to really engage right. with whatever I commit myself to. So it's hard to convince myself to do superhero stuff. Right, I'd like right. to. I don't know. So I was going to ask you, is that is that... I wouldn't say an ambition, but is that something you would like to... If you had the opportunity to draw, like, a superhero character, you would... Yeah, I totally really would. It's just... I, I, sometimes I find that genre can be a, a clumsy fit for what I want to talk about. Yeah. And sometimes being direct is the way to do it. Or sometimes one genre is not right, but another genre is. So, right. Um, I, I don't mind working in those kind of symbols, but... Sometimes it's just like too awkward to fit, it dilutes the impression right. and the power of it. So what drew you to like comics as a medium for your art? I mean, I, I, I see that you've been a fan of like the medium, but what made you, what, what was the moment where you decided, this is how I'm going to express myself through sequential art? How did you come to that realization? Well, the, the lofty explanation is, for, for me, comics is, like even though it's a visual medium and it's a hybrid of text and pictures and all of that for me the, the real stuff of comics is all its absence you know so it's the the stuff between the panels the stuff between the panels the gutters it's what you leave out it's how two dots and a line make a face it's it's why you choose three words instead of having a paragraph in a novel so for me comics is all about what you take out and um, you know like in Japanese art in theory it's like it's called ma it's like it's it's the absence intentionally left for the artist or the audience to occupy with their own consciousness. Right, right. And so for me, it's like, it's, that's the real work of it. Which is crazy, because the real work of it is unseen. And <laughs> you spend all of the time drawing intricate panels and... Yeah, I mean, like, so like, even if you look at my art and my illustration, it's all about... It's very deliberate lines and it's all about what I take out. Mm. So... That translates to my comic book work as well, my storytelling. So, uh, are, going back to this idea of like superhero comics, though, is there a particular superhero that you would like to illustrate? That if you were given the chance, you would say, "Yes, that's the one that I can tell my story, that can communicate the things that I like to communicate." Because there's a reason why I feel like, as nerds of color, we kind of gravitate towards these genres right. as, as kind of like marginalized communities. Why? Why do we identify with the X Men? Why do we identify with Superman? Yeah. Is there any particular character like that that you identify with? I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to give you a reason, but my answer and my reason are not thought through <laughs> at all, and I'm making it up as I go along. That's why we're here. But I grew up on, like, The Incredible Hulk, so I have, like, a crazy unnatural <laughs> attraction to Incredible Hulk stories. Right. I don't really know why. I think what it might be is... So the, the anger inside of you. Is it? <laughs> that was the wrong response. No, but I, I think I think what it might be is like the superhero genre, like the the power, fantasy, and the transformation, and stuff like the Superman kind of thing, or the revenge story, or whatever it is. It's I think it's a tough fit for an Asian identity, but the kind of outsider, misunderstood, monsterish really good at math <laughs> I don't know like I don't know am I am I making the stereotype worse I don't no, know no not at all in fact I don't know if if, um, if anyone out there knows of the writer Arthur, Arthur Chu he was uh, he was a Jeopardy champion and he since parlayed that into being a columnist on like the Daily Beast and Salon he actually wrote a thing a couple years ago about how the Hulk is kind of like the repressed rage of like being Asian American and what's interesting is that like Marvel has recently made the Hulk an Asian American. Yes. Uh, the writer Greg Pak has put out a book with uh, artist Frank Cho called "Totally Awesome Hulk," which is about Amadeus Cho, who is a Korean American character who is now the new Hulk. So I don't think there is anything like stereotypical. In fact, I feel like I mean, if you've ever, ever heard of the website Angry Asian Man, you know, anger is definitely something the that Hulk we is experience. Angry Asian. Yeah. yeah, that we experience as Asian Americans. Maybe. I don't know. I'm also like I, I was born and raised in Australia, so I feel like I'm pretty chill. I don't know, <laughs> but I live in Brooklyn now. So. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's it's the Brooklyn. Oh, maybe that's the whole Hulk thing. Yeah. Maybe my Hulk. wrist banner is Sydney. Yeah, there you go. And Brooklyn is my Hulk. I don't know. That's very. I can tell that you're working through this right now. 
Yeah. <laughs> Say the metaphors. <laughs> they, they just stack on top of each other. Uh, so, what has the experience been this whole weekend for you? Now that you, now that we're kind of winding down, how have you, how have you uh, kind of taken in all of the, just the experience of being here at Crosslines? Yeah, I've been tied to the mural pretty much all weekend. Because um, it's like, it was live painted right. over the weekend, as you know. But um, it's been good to see people chill out in our area. We, yeah. have, we have a monopoly on the comfy chairs. <laughs> we do. And we have a reading area, so I feel like it's a chill out area. And yeah, I've been spying on your talks and <laughs> eavesdropping on uni and everyone. But so, just yeah. like the concept of like, like the intersectionality and, and this, this kind of culture lab experiment. Like how, how, do you, how do you feel, you just kind of, your work being a part of it? It's, uh, it's crazy unique, because like usually you're screaming at the top of, maybe I am angry, angry Asian. <laughs> yeah, and usually you're, you're screaming at the top of your lungs and making work right. about this in isolation to say it all at once. It's, yeah. it's pretty powerful, I think. Right. Well, and I feel like it, it, the thing about it, like our identities intersecting too, like we're, we're Asian, Asian American, Asian Australian, but also seeing all of the different cultures coming together, and, and then the people touring around and interacting with everything, I think, is really interesting. Yeah, I like that it raises so many questions and discussion, because um, that's the way I... That's my relationship with my own intersectionality in my life. Like, I don't... I'm, I'm just... I just walk around confused, mostly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I well, and, it's, and it's like, I've, I've been seeing you over there at your mural, and you're talking to people as you're drawing. Like, yeah. what are some of the questions that you're responding to, what are some of the, uh, you know, conversations that you're having with the patrons who are walking through the museum and, and just drawn to your, your mural and drawn to the comfy chairs here at the Well, restaurant. it's strange. I, I feel like because other people's um, corners and artwork and installations, they're complete concepts, and so they're engaging with concepts, but because mine has a display of messy paint everywhere and, <laughs> and I'm drawing and painting in front of people, right. the questions are very practically about what I'm doing and how I'm doing it and how can they do it and how do you become how an illustrator. <laughs> yeah, and all that kind of stuff and what are you using and Interesting. did you do this first, did you do that first? So there's not a lot of like conversations around like concept or ideas, it's more like practical? Yeah, there totally is, but I mean, yeah, like it's people... I think people like see things in the work that they like from pop culture as well, and they pull up YouTube videos and right. artwork and stuff to show me. Oh, really? Like, I don't. It's kind of cool because I guess we're we're in a section where it's very much about sharing media and books and stories and all that. That's what people are doing with my work too. Yeah. So, uh, how can people find you on social media? Are you pretty engaged in social media? Um, yeah, so my Instagram is Maddie underscore Huyn, H-U-Y-N-H. -H. Um, my Twitter is the same, and my website is mattquinn.com. And the comic is sbs.com.au slash the boat. And that's the boat. So uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy uh, illustrating to come talk with us. Yeah. On the Stay tuned for my conversation with comic artist Umi Sakugawa from Crosslines. All right. Uh, welcome back to another uh, talk with uh, an artist here with the Hard Knock Life podcast, Nerds of Color. This is an impromptu one. It's not on the schedule. But uh, Yumi Sakagawa here is uh, exhibiting just uh, down the way. Uh, agreed to come talk to me for a little bit. So welcome to the Hard Knock Life, Yumi. Thank you for having me, Keith. Um, so before we talk about you, uh, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing here at Crosslines at the Smithsonian? So for Crosslines, I have a multimedia installation called Fashion Forecasts. And the Fashion Forecasts is a fun and playful visual exploration of utopian fashion predictions as seen through the lens of a second generation Japanese American woman. And using the medium of fashion predictions to explore different issues in a playful way, whether these issues are gender expression, ethnic identity, community outreach, sustainability, technology, intergenerational collaboration, speaking to the elderly, speaking to and respecting elderly citizens, and many other things. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's the perfect kind of uh, distillation of what this whole event is about in a way. Yeah, I was uh, really excited that the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center was putting together an exhibition based on intersectionality. And so when they approached me with that theme, initially to create a zine, I immediately jumped to fashion forecasts, which was a very informal drawing series right. that I was posting on Instagram. Right, so. yeah. I was going to say, because like, how did that evolve from, you know, like random drawings to like this whole exhibit was that you know when when you were first approached by the Smithsonian was that like designed like oh I'm gonna take this thing that I've been doing kind of like informally and, and blow it up into something more formal or was that just like after the fact it was exactly what you said um, <laughs> it was uh, my first fashion forecast drawing in two, 2014 and basically I was just doing it on and off on Instagram and posting them to friends on Facebook. <laughs> and at first they were just meant to be really silly, they didn't have any deeper meaning. But I think as I created it more and more, I started seeing certain themes emerging like Asian American identity, spirituality, and mindfulness, and fashion becoming this weird interactive and performative thing. So it really was just a very serendipitous thing where just as Fashion Forecast was starting to become a little more serious, well not serious but a, a little more meaningful, that was when Adriel Lewis, the digital curator of Smithsonian APA, approached me. So it was just this weird perfect timing yeah. where, and, yeah. So like, can you talk a little bit about, like, did you have a kind of a uh, affinity for fashion to begin with? Is that why you were doing those drawings on Instagram? Or what was, what's your connection to just like drawing these kinds of whimsical illustrations? I have zero background in fashion, <laughs> seriously. Um, and even as a consumer, I think my interest in fashion is pretty middle of the road. I, I do like to be conscious of fashion choices and make interesting choices, but I wouldn't go as so far to say I'm a fashionista. <laughs> so it really came from a very non-fashion person's perspective. Right. And that's kind of important too, because like I think what's interesting about your exhibit is that it does show that fashion is something that we can use, that can be used to express individuality, of course, but also like identity and culture. That's kind of, I feel like, what you're what you're talking about in your in your work, right? Oh yeah, definitely. I, I feel like what's important in making fashion forecast is that I what I want for fashion is for it to become more accessible for people to participate in. I think I think in the past I was a little maybe even turned off by fashion, right. especially a high end runway fashion because it seemed like a hobby just for rich, famous, and beautiful people, exactly. like for 19-year-old models from Russia and <laughs> celebrities, and I, I couldn't relate to it because it felt like a different sphere of influence and stature, but I feel like that's why I've been getting so many positive responses for Fashion Forecast, because instead of fashion being a vertical structure where it's top-down, trickle-down effect of, of power and influence to consumers, I want fashion to be a more horizontal structure right. where anybody, uh, no matter what their background or their age or body body shape, body type, can join in on this ongoing fashion conversation. And in addition to the actual exhibit, you have zines that are available at your station, right, that people are taking, uh, right? Is, is that a... Yes. Yeah. Um, it's, it's funny because I was originally approached by the Smithsonian just to make a zine, but then it ended up expanding to it being a zine and also a possible installation. <laughs> so the zine is sort of the Rosetta Stone <laughs> where all other uh, components of the installation came forth. So it's really exciting to both be able to give people something tangible to take home, but also to show the 3D version of these very conceptual drawings. Yeah. Is this your first time doing like a physical installation, like moving beyond just like illustrated comics work? 
It's funny you ask that because as an undergrad at UCLA, I was actually an art student and my focus was on paintings. So I did student exhibitions during UCLA and then after that, I exhibited here and there at a giant robot in West Los Angeles in group exhibitions. But, but for the most part, my medium is primarily books and scenes. So doing an installation like this is definitely out of the ordinary. But another comparable event that I did was just last year at the Japanese American National Museum for the giant robot Biennale, which was a retrospective of giant robot art, giant robot affiliated artists, where I got to do a on-site mural and video projection of my comics. And so this is all very new to me, but it's definitely a direction that I want to explore, mm -hmm. basically embracing more multimedia interdisciplinary work as opposed to just comics and scenes. And so, like, can you talk a little bit more about that process? Like, how, how does your comics and zine work kind of, in, like, not inspire necessarily, but like, how did, how did you, like, I wouldn't say evolve yet either, right? But like, can you talk about how it informs maybe, like, this, like, actual, you know, the, did you didn't, did you sew the clothing or was that? Definitely not. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wanted to be very clear that all the clothing and fashion forecasts, they were all created by my fashion designer friend, Robbie Monsad, who is based in Los Angeles. Right. I can't sew a button. <laughs> But, but can you talk about like that kind of like the, the, the difference between doing comics work and then doing like a physical installation like this? Definitely. I think it, it's funny because I didn't really do comics and zines during college where I was focused on paintings and except for maybe very casual comics on my journal. But I think I think I was frustrated by the medium of paintings because you as a person had to be physically present in front of the painting to fully experience it. And I was drawn to comics and scenes because I like the multiplicity of being everywhere uh, at once mm -hmm. through duplicate copies so people can have their own experience reading my works whether they're on the commute or in the privacy of their living room or at a cafe with friends. And, but then I sort of, the pendulum swung back again where I realized that in addition to being in multiple places at once through duplicate copies, I also loved through my mindfulness um, training, uh, self-training, the idea that you have to be at a specific moment, at a specific place, to experience this ephemeral experience. So, what inspired me to do a video projection at the Japanese American National Museum was that I usually do comic readings when I present my works to public events. And people respond really well to seeing comics projected on the wall and being read to, <laughs> even as adults. And so I think now I'm at a point where it's not that one medium is superior to the other, uh, whether it's a printed copies or an actual physical display, but really embracing both. Yeah. The strengths of the strengths and limitations of both to give people a wide variety of experiences. I mean, it's interesting too, because like comics kind of are already a multimedia thing with like text and images, like working simultaneously, you know. Uh, what, what drew you to doing comics in the first place though? Like you said, you, you kind of studied fine art in, in college. What, 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 other than this like kind of being, you know, closer to the reader and things, why comics specifically? Well, it's funny because as I, spoke earlier about embracing both mediums, whether it's a painting or duplicates, duplicate copies of an artwork. I think with coming to the comics medium, it was the same thing where 
I was always drawn to creative writing and drawing, and it really tortured me as a kid <laughs> that I couldn't do both. I had this idea that, because I think society, they expect you to choose one thing and specialize in one thing. So I had so much anxiety that I had to choose to be a writer or an artist. No one told me that I could do both. <laughs> and so finally, having to comics was just the perfect blend of the two things I love doing. And it's funny because now that I've sort of forced myself to specialize in comics, uh, it's really only in the last year that I'm opening myself up to other identities as an artist. So doing interdisciplinary things, doing more uh, multimedia installations, or even focusing on just writing or just art. Basically doing doing a lot. Doing everything. <laughs> doing everything. <laughs> Uh, where can people find you, like, online, for, if they wanted to find more of your work? So, I think uh, the easiest would be to follow me on social media. I'm pretty active on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, my handles are just uh, my name, Yumi Sakugawa, one word. Uh, Facebook, it's facebook.com slash universe and I finally forced myself to get a Snapchat account, which is also Yumi Sakugawa. So I still haven't figured out. I still haven't figured out how to use Snapchat. I'm I've made like three posts, and I'm probably using it wrong. And <laughs> all the seventeen-year-olds of the world are probably laughing at me. <laughs> I'm irrelevant to them. That's okay. We love you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take one more break, and actually, we're going to pick back up. I want to show the audience some of the work over there at the Fashion Forecast exhibit. So. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we'll be right back. So, Fashion Forecast is a multimedia installation of Utopian Fashion Forecast. So, there are different interactive and non-interactive components to this space. So, uh, I think the first thing would be we could start with here. Um, so. So these are outfits constructed by my fashion designer friend Robbie Monsad based on my conceptual drawings. This is a pho dress which is inspired by the leftover broth that you see nestling at the bottom of a bowl of pho. So the, the outer cardigan and skirt, I wanted to evoke the semi-transparent broth color. And if you look carefully, there are thick rice noodles nestling underneath the fabric. And I specifically wanted these uh, sort of pearl-like pearl things to represent the beads of fat, the shiny flecks of fat that comes from the meat. And the sequins are like the red chili oil. And there's um, mint leaves and other herb leaves that you throw into a bowl of pho. Um, and this one is a family altar ancestral worship ceremonial everyday wear. Um, basically, it's inspired by the family altars that you see in homes of Asian families where it's about honoring the dad, honoring people who have departed. And so I actually included a printout of my grandmother, who uh, my Okinawan grandmother, who passed away last year, and the shoulder pads have incense sticks. I wish they were burning, but I think that would just that. be let you do that. that might have been a slight fire hazard <laughs> in this historical building. Um, I wanted uh, sort of bells and tassels, and it was also important for me to include live flowers since there is usually a display of flower bouquets and also bowls of fruit as an offering to ancestors. So this is a really fun outfit to put together. And then this is a mud lotus two-piece outfit inspired by the Thich Nhat Hanh quote, no mud, no lotus. And Thich Nhat Hanh is a Buddhist monk from Vietnam and he's pretty popular in the self-help world. Even over here, a lot of his books are available in bookstores and he speaks a lot about mindfulness but uh, basically it's the idea that if you want to create a beautiful lotus flower you have to go through sort of the mud of life whether it's um, sadness or anger or frustration or feeling stuck and so there's obviously a uh, lotus flower at the top of the head 
and then uh, the middle part, the torso, sort of represents water. And then underneath that is sort of um, earth and mud and the muck of suffering, <laughs> suffering and sadness and uh, all the negative things that can arise from the experience of life. Did you illustrate the mannequins? I, yes, I did draw the faces on the mannequins, so that was all me. And it also references uh, other fashion forecast components, so geometric unibrows and also textile decals on the lips. And then there's a video projection, which was uh, really important for me. Instead of uh, just displaying the live, instead of just displaying the uh, original artwork, I really wanted to have a big video so that people who are walking even from far away they could catch a few uh, glimpses of these moving images to to give the space a more dynamic effect. So these are the scenes which are based on the drawings that I started posting on Instagram and they're divided into different categories. There's a hair face body component, a food inspired fashion, um, family, plant life environment, uh, spirituality, so you can see the actual mud lotus outfit drawing, and then there's like community uh, related community stuff, like a community cape. So and these, these are, these are the original drawings from Instagram? Or um, so they're of... based on the original drawings on Instagram. They were fancied up a bit. <laughs> and uh, that's the Community Cape Corner, which is an interactive art piece for visitors to touch or wear, ideally worn by three people, ideally for standing or sitting in reflective silence. And people have been interacting with the cape throughout this weekend, so it's been really cool to see people actually sitting in it. And finally the last part is a fashion wish tree and what happens with this is that people are invited to share their fashion wishes on the dress and this is inspired by the, the Tanabata Japanese tradition of hanging wishes on trees. So people have written a lot of uh, interesting forecasts. Uh, there's been a forecast for waterproof clothing, for like clothing that lasts an entire lifetime. People seem to like capes. Um, like capes, you're going in your cape now. Oh, awesome. So that's really great. So how's the experience yeah. been so far? It's been really awesome. I think it's been really fun to speak to a wide range of people, whether they're people who were already familiar with my work or uh, museum educators who are checking out the exhibit because they're in the area or just random families who happen to be passing through and stumbled into cross lines so I feel like all the responses have been really positive and so it's really exciting to share this completely um, heightened version of my Instagram drawings <laughs> to, to the greater public through the Smithsonian. Well thank you for, uh, for being a part of cross lines, thank you for talking to me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, it's the NOC. In full color, you see me? The hard knock life. Comics, movies, and TV. Yeah. Pop culture with a different perspective. Watch it on your screen. Hit play, so check this. This is the hard knock life, but not the chick of kind. More like the people the world seeking perspectives with a different line. The kids who share the interest together with a similar kind. When they said John Glover for Spider-Man, they didn't mind. The activists, directors, comments and the lectures. Fanboys, professional artists and professors. Maybe a nerd who's just like you. Talking about the things that you like too. So I invite you to the NOC. In full color, you see me? The hard knock.